Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the next on live Q&A session. My name is Kay and today I have a double pleasure welcoming two big names in orthopedic research. Both have truly international backgrounds, as you will see in my introduction. Both do amazing research. Both can be proud of an outstanding career. Both are wonderful ladies, as you will see, and both are role models for women who aim for a successful career in research. Let me introduce the both of them. And this time it will, might take a bit longer because as we're talking about career, I also want to make sure that you get a glimpse of their career. Let's start with Dr. Marcy Xenopi Wong. She's engineer and professor of tissue engineering and biofabrication at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the ETH. She completed her undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at the MIT and a graduate degree at Stanford University. She, she completed her PhD on the role of mechanical forces in skeletal development. As postdoc in orthopedic research lab laboratories, she did at the University of Michigan. After that, she moved then from the United States to Bern, where she, in Switzerland, where she became group leader for cartilage biomechanics. That's where she also habilitated. And from there, she moved to the ETH, where she is now, and where she became associate professor. Marcy works in the area of tissue engineering, in particular for cartilage regeneration. She develops functional biomaterials, which mimic the ex extracellular matrix. She uses a lot of biofabrication techniques to develop these materials. And I guess there's almost none which is not in her lab. She's successful in inventing, so she also holds four license patents. Now let's come to our second star in regeneration, Dr. Susan Chubinskaya. She holds the Klaus Kuttner Professorship in Orthoarthritis Research at the Department of Pediatrics, Orthopedic Research and Medicine at the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Her work focuses on the molecular and mechani mechanical mechanisms of human cartilage degeneration and osteoarthritis. She graduated on the other side of the ocean namely in Kiev, Ukraine. Then she did a, a credit student fellowship at the Orthopedic Institute in Lat Latvia, Litau. At the Rush University, Susan is also the vice provost for faculty affairs and the vice chair for research and faculty development. She also holds joint appointments as professor in the departments of Inter internal medicine and orthopedic research. As a researcher, she is an internationally recognized expert in the field of cartilage repair and regeneration, especially in post-traumatic and degenerative osteoarthritis. She's received multiple awards, and so far she secured more than six million US dollar of funding. She presented more than 250 lectures and contributed to more than 100 manuscripts, 12 books, and over 300 abstracts. She holds leadership position in a number of professional societies like the ICS, and currently she's president of the Orthopedic Research Society. So you see, today we really have two power ladies in orthopedic research here. We would have hours of, uh, of exciting discussion just talking about that research. But today we don't want to talk research, research content. We want to focus on other in exciting topics, namely, the differences between research on both sides of the ocean, namely in, <laughs> in the United States and in Switzerland. Then we also want to focus about, of obviously, about a career as a female researcher and give some advice to our young followers. And because we're currently in a special time, we also want to talk about COVID-19, how it has changed research and how it might change research in future. So I'm sorry for that long introduction, but I think both ladies deserve that introduction. So welcome to both of you. Welcome, Marcy. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Kay, for introduction. Thank you, Kay, for inviting. And thank you, Marcy, for agreeing to be our counterpart or my counterpart <laughs> during this conversation. We are very excited. And I would like to say hi 
to all who are listening us, who are viewing us, all the colleagues and friends across the globe. And it's really very, very exciting time for me personally to be able to chat with you even through um, on foundation organized morning hour for me and afternoon hour for you guys. Thank you very much. And I also want to, to use an opportunity to ask our audience, first of all, maybe say hi in, in the chat, uh, maybe tell us where you're uh, from. And whenever you've got a question, please type it in. We make sure to answer it. The more questions we get from you, the more exciting it is for all of us. But let me start. Usually in these interviews, I also start with something personal. And I would like to ask both of you, what actually made you become a researcher? And how did your career story start? Maybe in a few sentences. Who wants to start? I mean, I can go ahead and get started. Um, I always wanted to be in medicine. And um, when it didn't work out for me to become a medical doctor or an, uh, be accepted to medical school, I went to the university and it was done. It was defined that I'm going to become a researcher. My family is a family of physicians and researchers and scientists. And so there was no other option as either to be physician or researcher. Thank you, Masi. Yeah, so I, I kind of fell into this this technology. Um, I, I feel like when I was a child, my real love was for languages, for art, um, for music. Um, I didn't, I never saw myself as an engineer. Um, I'm a bit of a black sheep in my family because I come from an MIT family. Um, and there's a lot of pressure on all the members of my of my family to to attend MIT. So I did. And and once you're at that 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 uh, institution, you're just surrounded by by technology people, by engineers, by natural scientists. And it was really there that I kind of soaked it in. And I'm 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 super happy now with the with the choice. Um, but it wasn't um, that I knew from when I was five years old that I wanted to be an engineer, not at all. It's good to see how both of you are smiling, telling that story, because that really shows that you did the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> I love my job. Yeah, yeah. I love my job. <laughs> is, is there a special moment in your career where you would say that was the beginning? Something has changed now. A major milestone. Yes, um, and I'll start with probably earlier time when I came to the United States and I was postdoc in famous department of biochemistry under Klaus Kuttner. And when he offered me to stay as um, assistant professor rather than moving somewhere else, because usually the pathway of researcher in academia, you do graduate studies in one institution, then postdoc in another institution, and then first faculty position somewhere else. And you may remain in the same place, so you keep moving from position to position. When Klaus offered me to stay as assistant professor, that defined my long-term commitment to Rush. So I would say this is probably number one. And number two, when I received my first R1, it was huge. Uh, accomplishment for me personally, as being from a different country, from being trained in a different country, from different world, and feeling that you belong to the group, you belong to the society. So that was really a big one. Okay. May I say something yeah. similar on your side? Exactly the same. The defining moment was when I got my position at ETH. Um, you know, when you introduced me, one thing, one big thing about me that you forgot to mention is that I have four children and um, I, my, my scientific career, I think, was written off by, by very many people um, because I was way over the age limit that you're supposed to be under to get an assistant professorship. And there were a lot of um, people that um, were pulling for me, mentors. Um, behind the scenes. So um, for me, this was, um, I'm so grateful 
um, I think at that moment, the con the star, the constellation of the stars fell into the, the right place. Yeah, I feel very um, lucky and privileged to have had this opportunity at this, and if at I this may, wonderful school. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. And if I may add that another kind of big one is latest when I became the president of the Orthopedic Research Society because that is kind of a culmination of the career. And I feel it is a time when I really can give back to so many people who contributed to my career, to my success, to the society which defined who I am professionally, a society which allowed me to build so many friendships and collaborations. So that is probably a big one in the later year stages of my career. Now our followers, our listeners, they will think, well, how do I get to that point that I get that initial su success? Uh, can you already give some advice? Marcia, you said that that was a star consolation, but I guess it's far more than coincidence and destiny. Um, I mean, I, I think there is an element of luck, but I also think that um, when these these appointments are made, um, usually somebody stands up and says, I want this person. So even when you start as a, a master's student, PhD student, postdoc, I think building this network um, of, of people that, that have time to, to do this mentoring, because some people don't. Some people are just busy and don't have time to answer emails. Um, but to try to find those people, um, when you go to conferences that 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 can do that for you, I think this is this is important to have to have a network. I would add that it is your hard work, and definitely environment is important, and support and mentorship is critical. But as Klaus always said, I just open the door, and you swim yourself. It is critical to have someone to open the door, but without hard work, perseverance, sleepless nights, um, constant guilt that either you're not with children because you're working or you're with children, but you're not working and you're constantly feeling guilty one way or another, all of that um, probably defines the success. Uh, so I would, if I would put it in a nutshell, hard work, perseverance, and the right environment and luck, probably the three components. Mm -hmm. I, I guess if I would talk to male scientists, they might give similar advice. Uh, but how is it actually? What Are there special ch challenges that you face as a female scientist, especially in the area of orthopedics? What are these challenges? I think that um, it depends at which level. Orthopedic research is, um, or orthopedics, let's put it this way. Our field of orthopedics is a male-dominated field. Research is more diverse because um, there are more women in the research area. And engineering, actually, as well, there are now more junior faculty, junior uh, researchers. The issue is the leadership. Uh, and it's not only in orthopedics there are fewer women at the leadership positions elsewhere and everywhere, whether it is academic leadership, whether it is leadership within the field or within the society. And um, there are a lot of reasons for that. There's unconscious and conscious biases. There, um, you are not at the table when decisions are made and positions are decided who should be appointed but also it is part uh, in women nature because there was study some years ago which showed that at least 20 percent of women never negotiate for anything whether it is salary whether it is position whether it is workload whether it is help at home uh, there recently was an article in newspaper which said that it's not a problem with women winning it is the problem with women running, to convince women to put herself in the ring, to apply for positions, for awards, 
And this new generation is different, it changes, but if we talk about our generation, women always want to have 150% um, alignment or fit with any position which is open up. Men never do that. If men have 30% overlap or fit with the announcement, they will apply. Women want to be absolutely perfect, to have a perfect fit. And so it is a lot has to do with us and we need to change ourselves and be brave and not afraid of taking the risks. And even if we don't get positions, award, or we won't uh, advance to the level we wanted, it is all experience that we can learn from and which will be helpful in our next steps. Mm -hmm. Marcia, do you see it as similar? Yeah, I think um, there, there, um, there's a, lo a long way to go, but I think there has, um, particularly in the past maybe two, three years, been a, a big improvement that I've observed at my university. Um, you know, if, if people see a conference program and they're all men, uh, people will actually say, this looks, you know, what happened in the recruiting. Um, there's a there's a big effort um, when we search for new faculty members. Um, you know, you you need to have women candidates. So this kind of thing really is is new um, for my university, and so I I, I see a lot of improvements. Um, I see also that I've benefited so much with the women that came before me that have really made the way for it to be a bit easier for me. Um, this is thank right. you. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of efforts now on um, diversifying leadership and not only leadership, but every level in academia, student body, faculty body, leadership body. So there's very intentional approach from uh, leadership across the world on be having more diverse teams because it has been shown that diverse teams are much more successful. Um, but it is it's since the leadership, at least at the very higher level, it is still primarily male dominated without concerted efforts of bringing women and, and minorities and diverse uh, candidates to the table. We won't accomplish a parity among genders. And um, actually, uh, to Marcy's point about men panels, the president, um, director of the NIH, Dr. Collins said that he is not going to participate in any male dominated panels anymore. So if he is invited to speak at the conference and it is only men, he will refuse to do that. So that's what it means to have concerted efforts to change the environment. And we need to do it all together. It's not only women's job or only leadership job. It is everyone who makes these decisions, who creates these panels, who creates conference agendas. And we're doing a lot at, at the ORS level to make sure that we are diverse in every aspect of diversity and that every member of the society, regardless which part of the globe this person is or which gender, which ethnicity, have equal opportunities to contribute to the research, to the science, to the leadership and to the greater good of the society. Thanks a lot. Before we continue, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome our audience. It's huge already and it's really international. So let's let's start. We've, we've got people from Bern. We have some from Houston, from Cambridge. Uh, we've got Italians. We've got one from Brazil, one from South Africa. So almost all the continents. And we've got the ICIS office here and we've also got OIS listening. And and somebody from Germany. And I think people really like it. So I'd like to read one comment. We've got no questions yet, but a comment. So Kiki says, true words, tough to change the mindset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think with you, Susan, coming to the leadership positions, you can probably change it or will change it very quick. Now, if you look at the ON Foundation, we are also very male dominated. What advice would you give to us? I think it was my first comment when we met 
with UK a few years ago when you showed me the composition of the board, I said that this board would never be approved in the US because the board consists of 10 males. And I think that um, if you walk the walk, the talk, and talk the talk and walk the walk, you need to change the composition of your board to truly represent a diversity of members of UN Foundation, of followers of UN Foundation, and not only followers and members, but those who you support. Because you support with your fellowships, with awards, with uh, grants, you support a very diverse group of researchers. So you, your board need to represent your target audience. So that's number one. Number two, Marcy was talking a lot about mentorship and role of mentors in uh, one's career. The two aspects of a success, mentorship and sponsorship. And sponsorship doesn't mean financial sponsorship. Sponsorship means someone who is identifying opportunity for someone else and takes an active role in promoting this person and making sure that this person gets the position. Uh, so if you compare sponsorship and mentorship, mentors are usually on the backstage. You come to mentor for advice. It could be for a specific question, specific area, specific project. And mentor helps you to gu or guides you through the process. Sponsors are the one who puts the word about you who nominates you, who writes the letters of endorsement, who talks to people who makes decision and brings your name to the table to make sure that women or uh, uh, diverse uh, minority member of this group has the chance to be part of the pool, has the chance to be considered. And without this active and concerted role, it's very hard to change the landscape. What does a student have to bring to get you get you as a sponsor? Maybe Marcy first. Well, um, you be a part of my research group, and uh, I'm committed to being your sponsor. Um, depending on if your path is towards academia or um, um, yeah, if you want to go into industry. Um, I, I feel it's part of my job to to um, yeah, open the path for for people. Um, I on purpose don't have a huge research group because I, I want to be able to to know each person and to, to see each person every day or every week um, and um, to know enough about the path that they want to take. Mm -hmm. So. Um, mm -hmm. Susan? And it can be very intentional or unintentional. If you take any student as a PI, you have obligation not to men not only mentor the student, but introduce the student to authorities in the field, provide the opportunities for students to go to the conferences, present. And when student is ready for the next chapter in their career, you talk to your colleagues, you talk to your friends, you find opportunities for the student for the next uh, training or for the next job. And it is sponsorship. It may be not as big as getting someone being on the board of the society, but it is extremely big for this particular student because if you help the student to land at the next level, at the next institution, at the next lab that you know will shape the student and will help the student to become successful researcher, it is as equally important. Mm -hmm. But you do need to see commitment from the student, mm -hmm. commitment to research and commitment to the career. Yeah. I just saw there's a good question which came in from Francesca. And she asks whether mentorship, mentorship is gender related or, can a, or is a good mentor gender neutral, genderless? What do you think? I mean, I think I, 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 I probably 
talk to my female students um, in a bit different way um, because many of them are thinking about, you know, can I can I combine a family and a career, um, and when should I have children? So there are definitely things, topics that come up um, with 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 women. I would say that first of all, it's not one mentor. It is a very popular concept now as mosaic of mentorship, because we all have many mentors simultaneously and during our careers. It might be research mentor, it might be our cheerleader, it might be our career mentor, it might be someone who doesn't think that this person is your mentor. And so I would say, in general, it is uh, gender neutral, but as Marcy pointed, that there could be some specifics that female students or early career faculty would feel more comfortable discussing with a female mentor than with a man mentor. But in, again, it really depends what area of mentorship it is, whether it is something like, should I go for this grant or how I can get this grant or can you help me to write this grant or this paper? It is really gender neutral, but if it is on the career path and when to take certain steps. It might be specific that female students would feel more comfortable with female mentors. Thank you. Unfortunately, time is running and we have two more exciting to topics, so <laughs> I'm afraid, but maybe we, from here we should move to the next one, which is probably related. But before we do so, I'd also like to welcome uh, people from Doha and from Bucharest and from Freiburg in Germany. So we're getting more international. So now let's move on to the next topic which you had and that's differences and similarities of the research environment in United States and Switzerland. And maybe let's start with common points. What's common? I would suggest Marcy starts because she was in both systems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think no matter where you are in the world, if you want a, um, a, a career in, in research, um, you know, this is, I think, Susan, you, you, you mentioned this when you came to visit, it's a career choice um, that, you know, you're not talking about a nine to five job, you're talking about a kind of job where, you know, you're thinking about it all the time and it, it's a it's a topic and thing you're so fascinated with that it doesn't feel like work. I think this is um, um, I think I think universal um, for for research that you need to you need to engage with the topic so that it doesn't feel like it's it's work, and then kind of everything kind of flows. Um, I would say I would say. Um, career in research, it's a lifestyle. It's not a job. Because as Marcy said, it's not nine to eight or eight to five. It is 24 <laughs> seven. It is yeah. 24 seven and you can't turn off your brain. Even when you sleep, you come up with best ideas probably during the night. Um, I think similarities are, you can't be successful without ability to communicate verbally or in a written way, formulate your ideas, hypothesis, write grants, write papers. So I think that organization of research is probably very similar. Um, what might be different and the need for writing grants and having financial support to do your research. I think right. it's universal. What might be different is the way how the uh, compensation or um, salaries are structured for principal investigators in both worlds. Um, if you talk about lab personnel in both sides, at least I think uh, you have to come up, as a PI, you have to come up with research support, with research funding for your lab members. But the way how PIs are supported, I think that is uh, some differences which, um, and it's actually differences not only across the globe or Atlantic, but it is differences within the, between the institutions within the country. Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question from Francesca, and she actually knows both research environments as well. And she asked, how about the challenging in the US in the reduction of tenure track, while in Europe, the stability of position that assure at least a continuity? I guess that's it's related. But, right. Hmm. It is, I mean, tenure is a very um, controversial topic and very hot topic now in academic medicine in the United States. Traditional tenure assumes that uh, salary of the PI is covered by the institution. And PI focuses on bringing grants to, to be able to run research and to run your laboratories and support your lab personnel. This model is unfortunately moving away because institutions cannot afford to have large number of faculty with uh, reasonable salaries to be paid by the institutions. And COVID-19 will make it much, much harder. So what institutions are doing now, they're awarding tenure of title, but not tenure of salary. And tenure of title means that if um, you have your tenure professorship, but institution does not have obligation to provide your salary, if you are successful and you bring enough grant money to support your salary and salary of your people, you will be there. If you don't have your effort allocation or support for your efforts might be reduced, but your rank and titles will not be removed. Mm -hmm. And it is highly challenging. It's very uh, stressful for PIs because uh, having one grant is not going to support your salary and you need multiple grants. It is a little bit different if faculties or PI is involved in educational process and uh, educational efforts are covered by the institutions through tuition dollars. But again, with COVID-19 and the change of reality, that might be transformed as well. Okay. Because mode of education is changing, there is a lot of self-learning and virtual learning, which might require less efforts on the, on the side of faculty um, in yeah, terms that, of education. Yeah. That's a good point to discuss as well when it comes to COVID. Marcy, how is it in Switzerland? You know, we are in a, in a very, very um, privileged country. Um, this country, um, you know, prioritizes research and education and does so at a, a high level and a consistent level. So we never have to worry about there's going to be an administration change and a cut of budget. Um, there is just consistent commitment to the universities and to education. Um, and it's it makes it um, a, a privileged place to do research. Um, and I, 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 I work I work very hard, but I, I don't have to worry that if a grant gets cut, I, I'm losing my technician or losing my lab space. Um, and I, I hear this these these cases from the U.S. Um, and I uh, yeah. I, I don't know if I would be as successful, I, I'm, yeah, if uh, I could do it. Yeah. Right, it is very stressful and uh, it is a huge pressure on the PI constantly submitting grants, except, ex um, especially considering that uh, funding level is very low, it's below 10 percentile. In many institutions it is eight, so you need to submit 10 grants to be funded, uh, for one, to get one grant funded. Um, the differences between public and private institutions, because in many public institutions, state provides salary for faculty. It might be lower than the public institutions, but it's still guaranteed. Um, but that changes as well. And we are not talking about undergraduate education, because undergraduate education, where faculty are hired to teach and their 100% effort is teaching, their salary is protected. We are talking about academic medicine or by biomedical research. Yeah. I just see there came an interesting question or comment in, probably from Marcy, because Jerome, he made a different experience in Switzerland. He thinks that the funding landscape in Switzerland for musculoskeletal uh, areas appears tougher than in the US. He says okay. there are no separate grant entities such as NIAMS in the US, 
apart from the ON Foundation, and of course, I'm glad to hear that, <laughs> uh, that focus on, on that type of research. In addition, yeah. he says the lab tech is terribly expensive in Switzerland and mostly not fundable by the uh, National Science Foundation. Yeah, so everything is expensive in Switzerland. Um, and it's true, there are there are many less options to, to go to. Um, there's the Swiss National Science Foundation, which is primary, the primary source. Um, so um, I think though that this is like NIH, NSF in the U.S. that it has a it has a very very high funding rate, um, but I it's 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 not that it's not competitive. Okay, so we see there's also disadvantage in Switzerland. <laughs> How about the advantages in the United States? So far, we only talked about like the difficulties, the challenges. I mean, we started with com com commonalities, not only disadvantages. Um, I think, uh, and I think it's the same in Switzerland. There is many opportunity to get funded through research foundations and industry, and uh, that helps a lot. And especially someone like Marcy, who is working in so um, clinically relevant field, which might have uh, very clear trans uh, translatability. Mm -hmm. into the patient care, I'm sure that there's plenty of opportunities from industry who want to develop different materials, different devices, different approaches for author regeneration. Mm -hmm. And these opportunities exist in the US as well. I mean, I've been funded by industry, small, big industry partners, small industry partners, biotech throughout my entire career. And if you're working in translational research, and it seems that both of us are part of translational research, maybe a little bit different, but it's translational research. Um, I don't want to say it is easy to find industry partner, but it's absolutely possible to have long-term relationship with one partner or multiple industry partners, and that helps as well. How about yeah. industry I mean, funding in Switzerland? I think um, the the, the um, organization in Switzerland would be the InnoSwiss, where you need to have um, uh, it's a prod uh, a program where they fund the academic partner, but there has to be a co-pay by by industry. I think this one is also um, has good good funding rates as well. So. Mm -hmm. I know that in Japan, for example, there is a very strong partnership between the government funding uh, agencies and industrial partner uh, agencies, and that helps a lot. The only downside of having uh, only um, funding from industry is that some institutions, not all, but some, especially when it comes to promotion, academic promotion and tenure, they don't value uh, funding from industry as much as from federal agencies like NH, NSF, mm -hmm. DOD. And so it might, um, and this, this advice for junior members, early career members that try to get secure your federal funding first before you go into industry funding. Because if uh, your institution requires certain number of grants or certain level of funding from federal uh, agencies, it might jeopardize your chances for being promoted to the next academic rank. Very important advice. Now we, now we talked mainly about research funding, which is a major challenge for research anywhere. But I would also like to ask you whether there's a difference in the approach to research. Is there an American, Swiss of do, uh, American way of doing research and a Swiss way? Or would it be the same? I don't. Th I don't think so. Okay. I don't. I can't come up with defining differences in approach to research. I mean, it is. Yeah, go ahead, Marcy. Well, I was about to say that um, because I think the the level of funding um, is is generous that you have the chance to do high risk things. I've heard in the U.S. that you often have to have 
much of the results already um, finished when you apply for these these grants. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, certainly in Switzerland, you can actually, um, you know, start high risk things that might not pay off. Um, I found quite easily and this I really appreciated. The opportunities to do high risk, I mean, it depends what funding you're applying for. Uh, if you're applying for um, R1 grants through the NIH, yes, you need to have a reasonable amount of preliminary data or research being done in order to get funded and show visibility of the feasibility of the project. But there is a lot of high risk mechanism, especially through Department of Defense funding. They have um, so-called discovery grants, which are high risk grants, and it's a very it's reviewed in an anonymous way. Um, reviewers don't know who is applying, which is very important because especially for early career faculty who are coming maybe from less known institutions, when reviewers see that you're coming from a different environment, maybe less supportive environment, they may not review your grant as favorably uh, when compar in comparison to someone who comes from MIT or well-established institution. And Discovery Award grants or high-risk grants provides this opportunity to eliminate any biases mm -hmm. and just to review the essence of your hypothesis and your research project. So there are some uh, opportunities for high-risk research as well. Thanks. Now, just one question maybe re regarding the research outcome. What do you think is the greatest scientific breakthroughs recently? Is there something? Hmm. Of course, that's a difficult one. One of them probably CRISPR um, technology, which is now, even I read somewhere the other day that it is used now for developing COVID-19 treatment mm -hmm. uh, and diagnostic tests. Probably this probably would be one of those. I, I've been fascinated by the link between the microbiome and almost every disease known to mankind, <laughs> including arthritis. Right. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> you are with yeah. It's a good one, yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> And okay. psychology and every disease. Yeah, depression, and mental health, <laughs> Mental health and every disease. And I mean, if we talk about ortho regeneration, all the developments was orthobiologics. I mean, PRP is only recently, um, all these developments with new scaffolds and new devices, which took place maybe over the course of the last five, seven years, it is a huge breakthrough as well because it is already in clinical trials and hopefully it will be approved on multiple levels, um, which is very innovative mm -hmm. and, and something very natural in a way, okay. if you talk about PRP. Mm -hmm. The ON Foundation funds research to a certain extent. Where do we see the biggest need for research? What should be funded? I mean, I, I find, um, you know, talking to people with regulatory experience um, that the situation is getting um, increasingly um, challenging. Um, there were a lot of, um, you know, media with the implant files and, and then the sense that everything is being cracked down even further um, to this to the extent that I think um, innovation is is being squandered and you know i look at what my research does and what my my research team is doing working on and i really wonder is any of this even going to have a chance um to help to help just because the the regulatory environment seems to be so so challenging so expensive um we're thinking, you know, should we should we work on food or something instead of a medical device? Mm -hmm. So this is my, think, my big concern. Yeah. I think that you need to fund any good idea and high risk and um, 
to provide this opportunity. And it depends whether those grants are pilot grants for early career or mid career. Because if I remember correct, most of unfoundation efforts in terms of funding research is to now enable early career researchers to succeed. Mid career researchers need it as much, maybe in a different way, especially those who might have some gap in funding and need to have an, another push or another opportunity to refocus and identify new areas or emerging areas of focus. So I think that diversifying your portfolio and um, fund high-risk innovative research, even if outcome may not be as desired, but to provide this opportunity that Marcy was talking about, I think it's very important. And that's a unique niche that Tan Foundation can identify for themselves. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that advice. I just see there's some more questions which came in. And maybe one is still related to research in comparison between both countries. And Melika asks, how about a chance to secure a professorship position after doing a two to three year solid postdoc in the States and Switzerland? Is that possible? So a single postdoc, I think so. I think the majority of people that are hired um, have just one postdoc. I would say that the number of postdocs does not define or does not predetermine success in a landing um, assistant professor position. I think what has been accomplished during these postdocs, whether there were some grants that postdoc received, whether research that postdoc is doing uh, will be different from the research of the PI that postdoc can develop this new direction and this is new research um, program, uh, how much postdoc has published, how independent postdoc can be. So I think that the number of postdocs is not important, important what has been accomplished during these postdoc years. Okay. You know, time is running. It's uh, such a pity. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe let's come to the next hot topic at the moment, COVID-19 and how it has changed and how it probably will change the research landscape. First, maybe how did it change your research, your team, your projects so far? I mean, if um, it didn't change my research or my projects, the only thing it put on hold everything because we are not allowed to be in the lab. So the only thing we can do is analyze existing data. Um, it will change later in a way that, and not only mine, but um, probably all of us, because I would expect that the funding from federal agency will be primarily diverted towards COVID-19, uh, development of therapeutics, development of vaccine and treatment, which means that um, I worry that the funding for orthopedic research or musculoskeletal research may be reduced. Uh, another way how it might affect that if positions are funded by the institutions, not through the grants, um, some positions, some people might be laid off uh, due to re restriction or loss, financial loss that academic institutions, especially academic medical institutions are experiencing, there will be limited resources available for travel to conferences unless it is supported through the grants. So it will be affecting at multiple levels and maybe different people at different degree, dependent where they are with their funding and their research careers. Uh, some people might probably refocus what they're doing and see how let's say, um, viruses, infections of that type of um, nature might affect musculoskeletal system. I don't think it's, we know anything about that. So it is a lot of emerging areas which might come up, um, but I worry that funding level might be reduced. In our field. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcy? 
Yeah, I mean, my uh, may, maybe I can just mention a few more personal things um, that I'm worried about. I think end of February, I just thought, okay, we just need to get through three months, four months, and there'll be a, this, this short set, shutdown, and then we can start and go back to normal. And I think it's now becoming clear that this is this is much more long term um, than people were anticipating. And you know, the concern I have is the the teaching um, and the, the mentoring of my group, keeping my group together. So much of this was done through you know barbecues and retreats and going to conferences. Um, and if how much of that will will not be there in the next year, year two years? Um, and how how am I going to to motivate my team to keep them mentally strong? Um, how 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 do I do this if if you know we have this this distancing? Um, how will how will I find collaborators in the future? Because these were always just you know you met on the person at the at the conference dinner you were sitting next to or on the bus to go to the, <laughs> the conference dinner, all of these sort of spontaneous um, meetings that really successful, wonderful collaborations came about from. Um, how, how will that all happen? Um, I'm, I think there's a, big, there's a big question mark in my mind, how to be a, an effective leader in, in the future. Yes, I couldn't agree more. How to keep engagement and connectivity and how to develop new relationship when we are all on Zoom, WebEx, and we are missing this um, occasional or not planned meetings and um, social interaction. It is, and mental health. I mean, people uh, will be struggling with the situation. And I agree with Marcy, it is, it is challenging from the funding side, from the um, global perspective, but it's challenging for each of us. Mm. And hard to plan. It's hard to plan for the future. And research is all about planning, right? And grants five years long, and uh, you're trying to plan ahead. And when all of a sudden you can't be in the lab and you can't do research, then how you can regroup and what can you do in this downside, because you can write only so many grants and so many papers, but you need to be in the lab to do it. Yeah, that, that's also confirmed by Sarah, who is listening to us, and she says collaboration between different groups will become harder and harder due to COVID-19. But there's something interesting from Francesca, who's also doing a lot of research, and she actually says she's been fully operational during the entire time with, a lot, with lots of rules that she had to follow but she could demonstrate that it's possible to work. I'd love to connect her in to, to share her experience. Maybe it we can do that afterwards. I think it depends also on the institutions and states because at our place, only essential research was allowed, meaning that if one needs to be in the lab to maintain a cell line or breed mice, uh, one person would be allowed for a short period of time but no one else is allowed to be in the lab. So it's probably depends what kind of research one is doing. And some states which probably were affected lesser than others, that could be the case as well. But we haven't been in the lab since the middle of March. Yeah, I think that's very important point, United States. I think uh, Francesca, she's from Houston, that's probably less affected than Chicago. There's some good news also from Germany, and I'm happy to hear that Melika says that the labs in Germany are also 100% functional. No. Wonderful. Well, it's, that's giving hope to all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, 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 uh, people are really with us. It's, it's great. <laughs> uh, there was, I've, I realized in the news and newspapers that the research in total became much more visible. Of course, mainly virologists, but it seemed like the public uh, interest has changed. Do you see that as well? Yes. And yes. I'm I won't be surprised if it will be much larger number of applications for graduate positions and undergraduate positions in the field of biology in general, or uh, virology and microbiology, um, 
because that's where hopes are and probably that's where people see that with any other god forbid pandemic or any outbreaks that's where jobs will be available and that's where funding will be so i think that um on the bright side we might have see an increase in students and um, research in the in these areas my my big hope is that science is now cool again and that <laughs> <laughs> that that's nice that we don't have to push the stem but it it's the cool thing to do uh, and what i also noticed it seemed like science became more collaborative and less competitive at least when it comes to covid research when it comes to survival <laughs> Do you think that could have an effect on the entire research landscape? I would hope so. I would absolutely hope so, because the best research is created in partnership and collaborations from different areas, and it will force us to collaborate more. We just need to find the way how to identify collaborators, not being at the, physically at the meetings or sitting at social dinners and social events but I'm pretty sure that it will force us to collaborate even more. Mm -hmm. Over the entire research fields. That's great. <laughs> There's an interesting discussion I was starting as well, and it's about actually the impact of research on politics. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that has become stronger. <laughs> Let's leave it outside of the conversation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that. I mean, I always say that I don't read any news related to COVID-19 except uh, updates that I get from either RASH or Association of American Medical Colleges from the chief of uh, chief of scientific research. And he sends weekly updates on every single aspect of COVID. So that's what I read, to stay away from politics and <laughs> influence of research and politics. Before you mentioned the idea to direct your research in direction of COVID, what is, was it just an idea or think, seriously thinking about it? It was just a thought. Just, just a thought for me personally, but I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes more realistic. Marcy? Yeah, I mean, I think you can't, you can't be a scientist without thinking about these things, even though it seems quite far away. I know a few of our um, um, polymers that we're working with, you know, they, we were just interested in them for their effect on tissue engineering, but they, they, you know, they have effects on coagulation and antiviral effects. And suddenly those, those properties that I was ignoring before seem really interesting now. So who knows? Mm -hmm. I saw many scientists during the crisis or in the beginning, they offered to help other labs like, like to mm -hmm. do diagnostics or whatever. Did you have these ideas as well? Yes, but I mean, the environment that we are in, there was not an opportunity, let's put mm -hmm. it this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question for Melika. How do you see how COVID-19 impacts science journals? She noticed far less publications recently. I would actually expect a huge increase in submitted publications now because whoever I was talking to, everyone was writing grants and papers. So I think it will be a period of very high level of submissions. Um, the way it might affect this ongoing conversation between open access journals and tra traditional journals, so it might affect in this respect. I think that now will be an increase in, in submissions uh, it might be uh, maybe then a gap later on because people will be back in the lab trying to get data and uh, revive their research and get the uh, research going. But I think in general, it will be, I, I don't anticipate having less uh, papers than it is 
now. Mm -hmm. There's another interesting question regarding communication, communication with the public. With the current push in science, how should the science community communicate with the general public? Maybe in, in future. Especially if you talk about scientific results, which always have some uncertainty. Difficult one. I think it's a, it's a bit um, challenging because as a scientist, I, I've had a few experiences where you talk to a journalist um, and they they want to make a story out of it and want to, um, you know, m make something more out of it than it than it is. Um, and I think this this can be a bit dangerous. So I've been particularly um, more cautious lately um, to to say concretely, this is not ready for clinical trials. This is just uh, you know, an in vitro experiment and it's maybe a first step. Mm -hmm. I think honesty and not to let hype to drive the conversation with community uh, and not to present what it could be, but rather stay true to the facts and data and even if the communication or information may not be as public would expect you to say, but as long as you maintain research integrity and as long as you maintain your own personal integrity and you do not provide, I don't want to say fake hopes, but um, ungrounded hopes that everything has to be well defined and validated prior of providing any hopes to the public. So honesty with where we are. Thanks. Unfortunately, we've already used all our time. We This hour went like nothing. Maybe do you want to give some last advice to the people listening to us or share your hope for the end of the crisis? Um, I, I think just as an example of, of when I got this invitation to speak, um, I think I was so excited about it because we had met physically before um, when you came to visit my lab in Zurich and with you, with you Kai. Um, and I think it, it, it shows how important the personal connection is. Even small um, connections can, can develop into something really important and um, I could tell right away that both of you were going to be cool people to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Same, yeah. as, uh, same as for me. Um, it is a great pleasure to be able to talk to Marcy and Kay, but to all of you who are listening and watching us, um, I'd like to thank Marcy and Kay for organizing that and Marcy being my partner and colleague in this conversation. Uh, my hope is that I'll be able to see all of you at the next ORS meeting in Long Beach. I know there are people who uh, have doubts, but I want to dream and believe that we'll be able to see each other in six or eight months and that we'll get to this new norm. We'll protect ourselves, we'll protect our families, our labs, our research, and we'll manage to stay connected no matter what the outside environment is. And I think that most important message from this conversation is we need to find ways to stay engaged, connected, and care of ourselves and care of yourself. Thank you. Great closing words. And I also want to thank both of you for the interview. It was exciting for me. I would love to continue another hour. But let's finish with citing Marcy. Enjoy that science is cool again and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe for those out there who are interested in the further comparison between the United States and Europe, tomorrow there's on Instagram a live talk by the lady in science. Uh, 
She's uh, Melika is also around. She's organizing that, and she discusses with her fellow postdoc in the United States. So it's search for Canadian science. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, thanks for everybody. Thank Have you. A wonderful day. Wonderful evening. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.